All right. Good morning, internet, podcast listeners, Facebook viewers, uh, those of you that are catching us through another uh, medium. Welcome to you as well, and welcome to a, another episode of How I Met Your Mortgage. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Adam Smith, with Just the Tips Coaching. And with us, pretty much as always, is our marketing director and one of our other coaches, Jen Weibauer. Good morning, Jen. Good morning. And we've got a great guest for you guys today, um, a guitar player, cyclist, hiker, parent, and real estate agent extraordinaire, Robin Gerlach. Welcome, Robin. Thanks for that intro, Adam. That was really nice. Good morning to you all. Oh, yeah. I don't play guitar, though. I will throw that out there. That's my wife. She uh, plays it. Uh, we can see the guitar. Uh, we yeah, knew, we yeah. knew the rest were fact, but... Uh, all staging. Uh, all, all staging. <laughs> well, hence the nature of the real estate lifestyle. Um, and we certainly knew the rest to be true from your social media activity. But, yeah, you've got a lot on your plate with a uh, young child and your real estate business and a pandemic and uh, your wife not letting you have friends come over and play um so yeah but um tell us about yourself robin um you're certainly your business and uh what you do in your free time and how long you've been in the game what you did before that hit us with all the highlights man all right i'll do the best i can um i'm actually from colorado i was raised in salida very small town about two and a half hours south of denver um yeah down near the town of five thousand right What's that? Down near the Collegiates. Exactly. Yeah, yes. Guys, uh, yeah, see people Collegiate hiking meet. 14ers. Odds are good. That's near where Robin grew up. Yep, exactly. That is where I grew up. Yeah, hiking 14ers. Uh, Salida was kind of a, it wasn't the town it is today. It's become, I guess, discovered. It's been discovered. And it's kind of a little more popular than it used to be. It kind of was an old depressed railroad town when I was growing up there. And now they discovered tourism and mountain biking and skiing and everything seems like within the last 15, 20 years, it's really kind of uh, taken off. Um, but yeah, beside the point, I then went from there. I wanted to get out of the small town feel and I have family out West and went to uh, go to California. I went to San Diego state university, I uh, got my degree in business and that really just kind of opened my mind up to the world. I uh, made a lot of friends from all over the place. After getting my degree, it was pretty much in the last housing crash in uh, 2007. Um, and I didn't know where to begin my career. So I actually uh, went with a friend down to Argentina <laughs> uh, and started teaching English and just wanted to kind of expand horizons even more. Um, from there, ended up starting a bicycle tour company in Buenos Aires, Argentina, which was, uh, I know, it's like, how is this going to lead into real estate, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, I was running a tourism business, uh, gu guiding people around. A lot of the clientele were from the United States or from the UK, from Australia. We really tailored to um, English speaking folks uh, going to Argentina and looking for a good way to see the city with good level of service. And there wasn't that when, when we started it. So we found a little niche there, um, and ran that business for about five years and wanted to expand it to Brazil where, so I met my wife down there in Argentina, but she's from Brazil, wanted to expand the tourism business, um, in 2015, 2016 to Brazil is around the time of the Zika virus. And it we fell flat on our face with that proposition. So we we're like, you know, what's next? And I was kind of ready to get out of tourism and try something new. So a good friend of mine that got me into the business of real estate that I grew up with, his name is Reed Puser. Um, he has been in real estate now a little over 12, 13 years. Uh, I guess he saw a little potential and a way to kind of open up a new career path for me. He came down to Brazil just to visit and planted the seed in my head. Hey, you should come back and work real estate with me. And so um, six months later, I decided I would take him up on that. And my wife and I started working on getting her visa to move back to the U.S. And we got back here very beginning of 2017. And I took the test like three weeks after arriving. So I had been studying in Brazil, knowing I was going to, you know, hit the market here and become a realtor in Denver. 
And um, so started in early 2017, uh, started my realtor uh, profession and career, and uh, I'm still learning every day. That's the great thing about this career. I never feel like I got the hang of it. Um, but here I am now about three and a half years in uh, to the business, and uh, I love it. I love helping clients, you know, make this big of a decision. In the beginning, it was quite intimidating, and I knew very little about real estate. I knew very little about uh, just homes in general. So I was a, a student of the game. I still am. Um, but, uh, you know, learned a lot the first two years. Um, I've now sold homes over a million dollars. I've sold land under a hundred thousand dollars, modular homes, uh, short sales. Um, so I've kind of run the gamut, so to speak of different kinds of properties that you can sell with uh, different types of clientele. Um, so, and in the first couple of years in real estate, you really have to kind of just hustle and, you know, <laughs> do what you got to do to survive. Um, but fortunately I was on a team. So Reed brought me onto his team with the Roots Home Sales team, Remax Alliance, and uh, just kind of gave me that foundation. Um, so I was very fortunate in that way. So that's my intro. I know it's a little bit long winded, but that's how I ended up here today. <laughs> um, no, and it's not long winded. And I actually want to circle back to some of it because this is really interesting. Um, I don't think that there's any doubt in anyone's mind that being a real estate agent on a team, independent, working for a big company, whatever the case may be, to be successful at it, and certainly in such a short time frame, I had no idea that your uh, real estate history had been so brief in the grand scheme of things, especially to have the kind of success that you're having, is a very entrepreneurial mindset in order to have that kind of success certainly in a relatively short time frame you've got to be able to exhibit that entrepreneur mindset and you're doing it through a right now through a viral pandemic and you've done it before you had an entrepreneurial enterprise going on in a foreign land another continent and witnessed a viral pandemic. Um, Rex, yeah. You're kind of an old hand at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know that we've had anybody that either dealt with Hanta or Zika or Ebola or anything else to that effect that would rival COVID. Um, obviously, there aren't a whole lot of people alive that would remember what went on during the Spanish flu, for example. Um, <laughs> so um, t tell us, what kind of... Uh, similarities synonymities are you seeing between your previous experience with this and what's going on right now yeah that's a good question um <laughs> i would say the the similarities are the industries that it's affecting um and maybe it was around that time in you know in 2016 i decided to get out of tourism because uh i don't know if it was the zika virus but it really i mean we just couldn't get it off the ground. Um, and it's, it's still going in Buenos Aires, fortunately, but I couldn't keep expanding and I just hit in the head on the wall. It's like, all right, time to try something new. Now, um, obviously we have to adapt a lot, you know, here in real estate for one, the coronavirus I think is, is obviously worldwide. It was, it's not so concentrated like the Zika virus was in Brazil. Uh, it seemed like it was only happening there. And so we were really obviously impacted and we were banking on the Olympic games, you know, to be our big ticket to get the tourism game off the ground, but it was just, uh, you know, nobody came. So fast forward to here, four years later, now coronavirus comes and again, tourism and hospitality are getting their most impacted, you know, in the service industries. Um, and I was kind of like, wow, I'm glad I'm not in tourism right now, you know, and I feel sorry for my friends who are, um, and in real estate, it's funny, as you guys know, I mean, our, the market here in Denver is just so resilient, you know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't care. The buyers don't care. They want to go out now and go buy a home and there's just not enough homes to buy. Um, that, that's a different problem, problem for your you know? entire career. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it, it's, you know, I haven't seen the housing crash that I know some of my fellow colleagues and realtors have seen in the 2007, 2008, where there's like 30,000 homes for sale on a given month. You know, right now we're lucky if we have 7,000 homes for sale on a given month. Um, but I would say the similarities are, yeah, you have to be, you have to find a way to, uh, you know, 
be a little more creative, you know, in your marketing. What are you going to do that's different? And I'm still working on that. I mean, this is all a work in progress. I was literally this morning, um, because you mentioned my daughter that, you know, I have a daughter who's six months old. We just sent her to uh, daycare today. It's her first day in daycare. So I know my wife's just like waiting, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's a tough <laughs> separation, you know, our first day away from our daughter today. And so it's like, okay, now I feel it's time that I really need to start upping my marketing game. I kind of had a, you know, a revisiting my marketing plan. Um, but cause coronavirus has forced us all to change. I'm kind of getting back to your question there. I mean, open houses, we can't do open houses. Um, well now we can, um, but with a lot of, uh, restrictions in place and I'm wondering if I'm going to go back to that, but that was one of the ways I built my business was just doing open houses every weekend. Um, you know, and, and it helped me get some deals that I wasn't relying on my team so much for. I was going out and, and putting in the work, setting up the signs, getting everything ready for the open house. I really enjoyed that aspect of the business because, uh, you know, you're literally out moving and, and trying to make it happen. Um, and so that I think was a big thing that, uh, in these last three months, like, well, what am I going to replace all my spring open houses with? I would always pick up a few clients in the spring at open houses, you know? Um, so I've turned a little bit more to social media, um, doing videos, trying to think outside of the box. Um, I've turned to agent masterminds to see what other agents are doing. Um, I'm never going to not be a student in this game. I'm always going to try to keep learning, um, from what you guys are doing, you know, you guys have incredible marketing. I see it all over, you know, and, um, so learning from industry professionals, I think is what, you know, I I'm really trying to do and lean on what others are doing who have been here before in this industry, um, has been kind of my go-to in the last few months. Um, but I mean, yeah, I'm still revamping. I'm still trying to create a marketing plan now for the next 18 months, you know, like I'm, I'm shooting for where do I want to be in 2021, you know, um, thinking hopefully past COVID and when a vaccine comes and life resumes to a new normal, I guess you could say. Um, so. so working on that. <laughs> so there are a couple of things that I really want our audience to key on that you said. Uh, mentioned. Um, we're certainly big, big supporters of open houses as a lead generation technique. Um, in your entire career, we've obviously had a relatively significant housing shortage in the Denver metro area. Um, and for those of you uh, watching, don't let the palm tree in the background fool you. I am in the uh, Denver market as well. Um, and yeah, we would need 30,000 listings to have a six month inventory. And now we're down to seven. Um, while 30,000 was significant in 2007, now because of the population boom, we would actually need that to have a healthy real estate inventory. So open houses don't sell houses. You don't need them. It's not, uh, uh, for those of you watching, at least here in this market, probably true in most urban markets, Seattle, LA, Atlanta, Miami, Houston, whatever, um, an open house is not for the purposes of selling a house. An open house is for the purposes of generating leads. And it is a great lead gen tactic that we are in full support of if you're doing it properly, if you're on site, if you're having good conversations, if you're doing good data capture, so on and so forth. But here we are where a global pandemic has kind of thrown a wrench in the works. And even where we are today, where a lot of places probably could have open houses uh, safely, legally, um, I would suspect that there's still an enormous percentage, the majority percentage of the population that isn't going to stroll through open houses the way that they normally would. If I saw one in my neighborhood, odds are good my wife would go stroll through it and she's not going to now. Um, those kinds of things. So the population, the attendance of what goes on in an open house is also going to be way down. So like Robin has done, a lot of you guys need to be finding substitutes for that particular lead gen activity. That's also true of, you know, networking events and a thousand other things that I can think of where we either can no longer do these events or the uh, attendance of them is going to be weighed down. And Robin has found some viable solutions where he's not wasting his time putting his entire life and career on 
pause waiting instead he's looking to solve some problems he's spending time with people that are figuring out how to solve some of these problems he's putting some other things into exercise that are going to help him supplement those lead gen activities that he can't or that he can't do right now or aren't going to have great results right now because of it and better than that, when 2021 rolls around, when 2022 rolls around, and Robin said it without saying it, guys, for those of you that are in the type of sales career that Just the Tips is shouting at, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a career, not a job. So he's laying some framework so that when he is able to do these things again, He's also got all of these other things that he's putting in place in the interim. And the combination of both is going to rocket him way past his competition when we do return to a new normal, whatever that may look like. So, Robin, thank you. I know that those weren't the exact words, but I really want our audience to cue in on how important it is to be solving problems right now in your lead gen activities how important it is to be supplementing in your lead gen activities so that when you're able to return to the things that you used to do you've got this much wider greater arsenal of lead gen tactics and techniques that you're able to exercise because that is going to make a very successful 21 and 22 for robin and hopefully for a lot of you that are listening or watching as well yeah, I mean, gosh, you 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 said it way better than I did, <laughs> and you, you you built me up there. I appreciate that, Adam. <laughs> um, I'm really, uh, I, you know, we have to adapt. You know, we have to change. I don't know if open houses will ever be a thing again as much as they have been, and I I literally don't know if I'll ever go back and do them again. You know, seeing all the restrictions that are in place, um, and now with the technology that we have. And we've all been forced to learn how to utilize the technology. Uh, why go back? You know, where it's forced us to adapt and become uh, different in our marketing um, and be more efficient, maybe, uh, where we can do a virtual open house. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that I am looking to do for an upcoming listing is a virtual open house and create, you know, a an event um, that goes through Zoom. So people have to sign up for it um, on Zoom. Then you capture everybody, everybody's emails. Obviously, you need to market it well to get it out there and say, oh, yeah, I want to see that house. And then have one person walking through the home at the time that, you know, one of us is sitting here kind of narrating from the computer of the features of the home. So you're getting a walkthrough of the home virtually, uh, which it seems like consumers are completely willing to um, adapt as well and get to know a home virtually these days. Um, I recently did a poll on my own social media um, when we had to do only virtual tours for a couple weeks there and asking consumers, you know, how many of you would buy a home site unseen or only touring it virtually? Um, and it was like 37% so they would be willing. So not the majority yet. Um, did it a couple weeks later and that number jumped to 45%. You know, so all of us are willing to adapt. Um, home buyers are obviously still going out and home shopping, um, but they, like you said, Adam, might be a little less willing to just go into an open house where there's three or four other families walking around and um, every, you know, everyone's taking a cookie off the plate. You know, um, that's just I, I think that's going to be a thing of the past now, and we're really turning this industry into a virtual world um, that. You know, it's either we adapt or, or we get phased out, you know. Um, and so th I, I'm looking at how can we utilize the technology we have, um, the Zoom, the FaceTime. I've been doing a lot of showings with clients from out of state who are looking to move here. And we're doing it via, you know, FaceTime or Zoom. And it's like, you know, hey, can you stop. Can you go back there and take a look at that? And it's pretty much just short of them being able to, smell the property if there's cat pee or anything like that. Uh, I'll try to convey that, you know, but, um, That's it, hilarious. It, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, it is seeing a home. I, I don't know if I would buy a home for myself and my family site unseen yet. Um, I don't think I could, if it's an investment property, I probably could. Um, you're a little 
less emotionally attached to how it feels in the home. Um, so that's going to be the only kind of challenge I see um, with with the adaptation that we're doing in our market is people being willing to put an offer in without actually going in, stepping inside of the home. But I think it's going to be more and more prevalent. I think that you're right. Um, I think that Jen and I need to show you how to uh, broadcast that uh, virtual open house so that people that didn't sign up for your Zoom can see it like what we're doing today. Um, yep. We run Zoom into uh, a broadcast software that then streams it out live to social media. Uh, so we'll certainly get there. I certainly would like to see Zuckerberg develop a live odor feature. Uh, so that we can uh, determine whether or not the house does smell like cat pee. And obviously, you really hit the nail on the head when it comes to owner-occupied property versus investment property. When we're buying investment property, we're looking at paper. We're looking at the numbers. Does it cash flow? What's the appreciation? What is my monthly rent? What's fair market rent? You know, what kind of positive cash flow am I going to have month to month? What kind of appreciation am I going to get year to year? Um, it's easy to look at it from a dollars and cents uh uh, perspective, uh, you know, looking at it on paper. But yeah, the majority, obviously, of homeownership is owner occupied property. And yeah, that is definitely a very different animal. But I would suspect as time goes on, uh, certainly with what seems to be going on with the uh, continued spread of the COVID uh, virus, of the coronavirus, um, that that number that jumped up to 45% for you will probably be the majority in short order, probably by the end of the year, 55, 60, 70%, who knows? Um, and I know you guys had an issue earlier on in the last few months where the only way you could even go look at a home in person is if you had already made an offer on it. I know that that was a very brief period and that the Colorado state government had uh, put you guys kind of through a roller coaster ride of yes. what was and wasn't essential <laughs> in your business. Uh, but I know that that existed for a period, maybe even 10 days. Um, and yet people were doing it, making offers on property so that they could go take a live look at it. Um, so, yeah, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, but, yeah, Robin is right here, guys. Adapt. Uh, survive, keep moving one foot in front of the other. We got to keep going forward. Um, but yeah, these are the kinds of things that are going to provide great success in, uh, well, anybody who's got this kind of a relationship to the consumer for their career. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, it's funny you mentioned that the, uh, <laughs> the roller coaster we went through. Um, and I think the most frustrating thing for realtors who are like, number you know numbers are huge for us we we analyze data as for you guys as well uh data is important and when these kind of things happen in spurts of 10 days and then you see you know a round of homes go under contract come back on the market you know it really kind of throws the data off of what's happening the behavior of the marketplace um and and in that instance i believe that was in april um it was really hard to analyze the data in april that we had you know because there are a lot of homes coming back on the market in that month. And it's maybe due to that reason, you know, in particular, like, oh, well, in order to see it, I got to get under contract on it. Um, that's happening. I actually have a listing in Boulder, um, Boulder Affordable Housing. And there, my sellers don't want anybody going in there to look at it. But I mean, it's it's a different situation because it's not open market. It's you have to qualify, get into a program and, you know, get uh, meet a certain set of parameters with your income and your assets in order to uh, get into the property or, or even have a chance at it, then you get thrown into a lottery. Um, whoever is chosen then gets to go look at the property, you know, but I'm wondering, you know, if there's 10 people, the first person goes in, are they going to still want the property? So this is going to be very interesting, you know, um, obviously I hope so, but uh that's what the whole open market was like for, like you said, about a 10 day stretch there in April. And it just threw the behavior of the market quite off. And uh, we're seeing a, a delayed, I think, spring market at the moment. And we're all wondering, you know, when is it going to slow down and settle down? Um, because May and June has just gone crazy. Uh, it's, you know, record number of contracts in both May and in June. 
uh, you know, in these last two months, the record amount of homes going under contract. And it's like maybe the pent up demand. Is it buyers who are, have been, you know, in their apartment and just tired of this life and COVID gave this, gave them a revelation, you know, like I need my own home. Is that it? Or, you know, is it, well, I was about to go buy a home in April, but then I wasn't allowed to even go look at homes, you know? So it's probably a combination of the two, but um, I'm just interested to see where the rest of this summer goes. Where is July and August going to be, you know, is it going to be back to the traditional seasonality where it usually slows down a little bit after 4th of July and people have to get ready for school. Um, but you know, our, our school is going to be opening. So there's still so many variables up in the air right now that I think, um, will influence the market. But at the end of the day, our, I'm really grateful for the Denver market that it is so resilient and there is such demand, you know, especially in that 300 to 700,000 price point. I mean, we're, we're uh, really lucky that enough people still have the financial, you know, wherewithal to make this happen, you know, throughout all of this. So True story. Um, I just hope- you included. Yes, exactly. Us included, you know, um, gosh, I was, I think all of us were a little bit skeptical, like what is going to happen? Is the market going to just shut down and crash, you know, and fortunately it's not. And if anything, it's, it's getting stronger. Uh, we just need more inventory to kind of balance it a little bit. Oh, that's going to be a long time to come. Going to be a long yeah. time before we have a balanced inventory, probably here or in any other major market. Um, and for those of you that are outside of this market, uh, I just want y'all to understand that this will be a fascinating study for Robin because Boulder and affordable is an oxymoron. Uh, it is certainly a, a, a very uh, expensive. I don't even know that I, I mean, it's uh, certainly a separate city uh, from Denver, but even the yes. bedroom communities of Boulder are very, very expensive. And for those of you unfamiliar, this is the home of the University of Colorado, and it is a spectacular town. Um, so it is a, a highly desirable place to live. So having any affordable housing there is going to drive some significant demand. I'll be real curious to see what the results of that are, Robin. Yeah, well, I mean, it's only it, it is sponsored by the city there, and uh, Boulder obviously has very limited supply because they have a moratorium on building there, and so with that, and the demand is always going to be strong. You're at the foothills, you have the university, um, you know, a lot of big companies moving there, and a big tech scene in Boulder, and so the demand is always going to be high. But then you have your high school teachers, elementary school teachers, um, you know, students. Uh, maybe service industry workers who don't make, you know, near the same amount and, but they still want to buy a house. And that's why the program was created um, to really help people get into home ownership. Um, albeit you, if you're in for a couple of years, your appreciation is limited as compared to what you'd get on the open market, sure. you know, and so that's always uh, the downfall. It is permanently affordable uh, to keep it uh, for, for those who are making more on the median area area income. So um, but yeah, strong demand in Boulder overall, <laughs> all over the Western, you know, front range here, really. Certainly true. Um, so, Robin, you've certainly given us uh, a lot of good insight. It's hard to believe how quickly our uh, time slot has whipped by here. Oh, but wow. I don't want <laughs> to shortchange you. Uh, there are probably uh, people in the audience who would love to bend your ear a bit. So give us uh, the highlights on how people can reach you. Uh, yeah, my, you can reach me well on social media, um, Facebook or Instagram, um, Facebook. It's my full name, Robin Noah Gerlach, Instagram, Robin dot Gerlach. Um, my email address is Robin at roots home sales.com. So that's my team, the roots home sales. So that's R O O T S H O M E S A L E S.com. Um, probably would have been easier to just put it at Gmail, but you know, it's like we, we got to go with the team brand here. So um, that's our that's my email. My phone number uh, is 303-957-6397. And yeah, happy to chat with any other industry professionals. Um, and we could probably learn a lot from each other. And yeah, I'm always looking to improve my craft. So I appreciate you having me on here, Adam. 
this is great. Thank oh, you. Oh, my pleasure, Robin. And I do want to address one more thing, despite us having uh, already run over that uh, you, you said but didn't say. Um, for those of you watching, Robin being so willing to uh, give out all his contact information and to hang out with other professionals and to help lift them up and allow them to lift him up is a piece of that abundance mindset. Um, this is the kind of mentality that is going to help you succeed, that is going to help you grow your business. And having a scarcity mindset is not going to do that. Could you get along? Could you be successful? Yes, absolutely. But that mindset that Robin just displayed for all of you is something that's going to propel him so far above and beyond what other people with a scarcity mindset are doing or will do uh, that I really want you guys to uh, key in on that as well. So thank you, Robin. Um, Absolutely. And yep. for those of you watching that would like to be on the show or want to see past episodes of the show or would like to see our weekly blog, our weekly video blog, The Little Tip, um, or would like any more information about Just the Tips, including how to get a copy of my book, Just the Tips, by all means, use that text code at the bottom of your screen, text TIPS to 63566, and it will ping you back.